Uh, thank you, uh, Maggie and Arnie Gunderson, for all the work that you're doing, keeping us informed about what's going on in the nuclear world. As uh, most listeners know, uh, nuclear energy has many issues, and uh, it's, it's it's really raised its ugly head in Fukushima over about a year and almost coming up on a year and a half now. It's uh, I guess it was around March 11th, 2011, when this incident happened, and Arnie Gunnarsson's been on top of the situation right from the get-go, and, and hopefully we're going to get Arnie uh, pulled up on the show before or after the first break. Uh, just go with a little bit of Arnie's background. He has 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience. And he is a recipient of the prestigious uh, Atomic Energy Commission's Fellowship for his master's degree in nuclear engineering. He owns nuclear safety patents, was a licensed reactor operator, and a senior and, and a senior vice president in his uh, career. Also, has managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. So just a tremendous amount of background in the nuclear industry and a, a tremendous credit to uh, him to come out and speak towards not only Fukushima, but what's going on in our country. And uh, hopefully we're going to get into a great deal into what's going on in Japan and also what's going on in the United States. It seems to me that a lot of this information has fallen off the mainstream media's radar, and that's a shame. You know, instead of giving us celebrity reports on a daily basis, we need to be understanding more and more what's going on in the nuclear industry and what's going on because this is a critical issue not only to your health, but the health of your children, their children, and the entire basically every life form on on the planet earth you know this this uh, situation is getting as i understand it i'm no expert in it i am a scientist but in a different field but as i understand it this situation is growing more dire by the day and hopefully uh arnie, arnie can uh, elaborate on that if that's true or not there are a lot of people that have youtube videos that are not experts in the field but they're uh passing on information and uh not sure if any of it's true all of it's true or or what the situation is there, and hopefully we can get down to uh, what's really going on at Fukushima, what we should be doing about it here in the United States, and what we should be doing to protect ourselves as individuals and our families. And hopefully, uh, if you have any questions, as always, the call-in number will be 800-313-9443. And uh, a little bit more of a background of Arnie. Arnie is um, Chief Engineer and Expert Witness at Fairwinds Associates. And that was formed and uh, founded in 20, uh, 2003. And uh, he has uh, worked not only in the United States, but in Canada and overseas. And uh, Arnie has joined uh, Fairwinds Education uh, at, in a full-time capacity in 2009. And by 2012, he has contributed more than 100 interviews, television, radio, and uh, and other, I guess, uh seminars throughout the world so i I really welcome morning to the program and hopefully we'll have him pulled up after the break we have a three-minute commercial break and we'll see you on the other side welcome back to capital forum today is sunday june 10 2012 and uh, once again we really appreciate uh, what maggie and arnie or gunnerson are doing from fair winds associates what they are doing to educate us on not only what's going on in Fukushima, but what's going on in the United States and throughout the world. And their website is fairwinds.org, and fair is spelled F-A-I-R-E. So fairwinds.org, you can uh, check out their information and help uh, keep their uh, organization going by donating. And uh, welcome to the show, Arnie. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, we really appreciate you uh, spending some time to join us this morning. I understand there's a documentary film uh, or so, uh, organization that's going to be showing up at your door in just uh, not too short a time. So we will, we really appreciate you uh, taking the opportunity to visit with us before you uh, get into that. Uh, so uh, well, This quick. is awfully important. I'm glad I could. Why don't you uh, start elaborating on what's currently going on in Japan? A lot of us know the history of Japan, but what is currently going on there and some of the costs associated with with what they're doing over in Japan and uh, and TEPCO's uh, attitude towards the whole situation. Well, there were um, 54 nuclear plants in Japan um, this uh, in, in March of last year, and um, they are all shut down right now. Japan was the third largest um, country as far as the number of nuclear plants. The United States was first, French was second, and Japan was third. So now all of their nuclear plants are shut down. Probably um, at least 10 are either so damaged from the tsunami or are so uh, 
so close to earthquake faults that no matter what, they'll never start up. The, uh, but, but there's a big debate in Japan right now, led by women, led mainly by mothers, about whether or not any nuclear plant should start up, um, you know, given what happened at Fukushima. So wh- where the plants are right now is um, uh, Unit 4 is getting uh, all the publicity. Unit 4 has got a nuclear uh, fuel pool that sits, they all have a nuclear fuel pool, that sit about seven stories in the air, and they're not enclosed inside a containment. But what makes Unit 4 particularly dangerous is that it has a full core offload of radioactive fuel. In addition to spent fuel that's been there for four, five, six years, there's hot nuclear fuel in the pool. See, when uranium splits, 95% of the heat happens like that, but then the 5% hangs around as, as the radioactive daughter products decay. So this pool is um, in danger of, uh, of overheating. As a matter of fact, just this week, um, one cooling pump failed and the backup cooling pump failed and the, the temperature rose about uh, 20 degrees in a, in a day. So it doesn't take long before it starts to boil, but hopefully they'll find some new pumps and get it running again. But the worldwide concern for Unit 4 is that if there's another seismic event, uh, if there's a Richter 7 or a Richter 7-5, that building is likely to collapse. Um, Tokyo Electric has already acknowledged that the side of the building has a bulge in it. And, um, uh, you know, the concern is that if the nuclear fuel is not in a containment or to lose its cooling, it would catch fire. it gets hot enough that the uh, uh, that the fuel actually burns in air. And uh, Brookhaven National Labs has done an um, a analysis of a fire in a fuel pool, and they said it would kill about 186,000 people. So it's a, it's a very dangerous situation. Everything will be fine if there's no earthquake, but, uh, but God help them if there's a serious earthquake. Well, now, is it true that the uh, the facility to store the fuel, the spent fuel rods, were it's, it was intended for a temporary storage? It wasn't intended for a long term storage, uh, which is the situation that's going on in Japan. Yeah, you know, I've been at this for forty years, and, and uh, the plan was in nineteen seventy when these plants were built, like the Fukushima units, the fuel would stay in the pool five years, and then it would be reprocessed. And well, five years came and went, and there was no reprocessing, so they put bigger racks in the pool to store more fuel to get to 10 years. And 10 years came and went, and they said, whoa, we need more racks to put in these pools. Now we've got, in the U.S., we have as much as 40 years of nuclear fuel in the fuel pools. Uh, in, in Japan, they were a little more conscientious. They only have about seven or eight years in their fuel pools. And then they take it out, and they put it in what's called dry cask storage. And Fukushima had dry casks. And they all survived just fine. They survived the tsunami and they survived the earthquake just fine. Um, the, the takeaway here for for the Callaway plant out in Missouri or any of the plants on the Missouri River or pretty much any of the plants in the United States is we've got to get that fuel out of those pools and into dry casks. The so problem they're is not, money. They're not they're not treating this in any kind of a respectful way as they should, and and I'm downwind from uh, the Callaway plant. I'm probably crow flight about uh, 100 miles away from that nuclear facility. So to me, that's a that's a dangerous situation. If I understand you correctly, well, Callaway is more robust than, than Fukushima. You know, Callaway is a boiling water reactor, but it's um, uh, I'm sorry, Callaway is much uh, much newer. So so the systems are more robust. But the underlying issue of the fact that the um, that the fuel pool has all of this enormous amount of fuel in it is is certainly true. There's as much radiation in the nuclear pool at almost every boiling water reactor in the country that uh, uh, it, it equals all of the radiation that was ever released in all of the bombs that were ever tested above ground. So we have a you know potential liability here. Um, you know, certainly an event that could uh, uh, could ruin your day a hundred miles away. <laughs> well, that's good news. <laughs> well, let's get back to Fukushima. Are, you kind of bypassed the actual core reactor. Is, is can we assume that the core reactor is based on that or in good shape? And there's no uh, concern there too. Yeah, well, well, Fukushima Four doesn't have any fuel in the core. 
Okay. They removed it, and they were doing modifications. So that's what makes it so dangerous is that all the fuel is out of the core. Now, Fukushima 1, 2, and 3 were running at full power at the time. So you know when you hear the reactor safely shut down, what that means is the nuclear fuel rods fell into the core or shot up from the bottom in this case, and the, uh, the chain reaction stopped. But stopping the chain reaction only knocks out 95% of the heat. There's another 5% that hangs around because the um, when the uranium splits, the pieces it splits into are also radioactive and are physically hot. So when, you sh- when Fukushima shut down, um, there were, the chain reaction stopped, but you had all of this extra heat. 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, Fukushima 3 was about 3 million horsepower. And so 5% of that is 150,000 horsepower. Wow. You know, that's, a, that's 150 diesel trucks running at full power. There's an enormous amount of heat that's being, uh, being generated. And that's why they, they boiled and, and blew up. So those three um, have containments around them. Now, the containments are leaking, but they're still there. Um, a lot of water is getting out into the groundwater and into the ocean. But the containments are still there, which which is an important distinction. Unit four doesn't have a containment. The um, the problem I did decommissioning of nuclear plants for a living, and these plants are so radioactive that there's no technology that could ever dismantle them right now. We're going to have to develop an entirely new um, approach to decommissioning these plants to take them uh, to to, uh, to dismantle them. The radiation level inside, near the near the, the nuclear core, but not not at the nuclear core, are lethal in in ten minutes. So that's that's a you know carbon based space life forms like you and me, but it's so radioactive that it's also affecting the circuitry in the cameras and the robots are trying to get in there. So uh, we really need to go back and uh, and think about how are we ever going to take these plants apart and uh, and dismantle them. Well, g- g- going back to the current situation, is there any way that this can be enclosed? Or is this, is, is this situation in Fukushima, is this just beyond the point of no return? Or is, or is there a way to recover the uh, and, and contain this? Well, Unit 4, which is the, uh, the biggest concern, Tokyo Electric has a plan where they're going to build a building on top of the building. Um, the problem is they're taking their sweet time. Um, now I, I said on a radio show last year that you needed to do just that, and they just came to the same conclusion. I think they're short of money, which is really frightening. They, um, if they build a building outside the building, they can remove the nuclear fuel and put it in dry casks. The problem is they're projecting that's going to get to 2015 before they're in any position to um, uh, to do that effectively. So... Uh, for four years now, we're going to be sitting holding our breath, hoping there's no earthquake, and that's uh, that's a frightening position to be in. The other units, you know, I think people are beginning to think maybe we can never dismantle these plants. Maybe we just fill them with concrete and walk away. The problem with that is that it ultimately does leach through the concrete and into the groundwater and into the ocean. And this stuff stays around for tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So it solves our problem for 10 years, maybe, to fill them with concrete and walk away. But, you know, the legacy you leave seven generations out is is awfully, uh, awfully severe. So uh, that's a question that people are going to be asking for the next uh, 10 or 20 years. How are we ever going to knock these plants down? Maybe it's better to just entomb them and, and walk away. It sounds like that's the best approach, and uh, perhaps after the break, you hear the bumping music, after the break, we can address it. There was reports that came out initially. TEPCO was just going to walk away from the situation entirely and just just leave it as is, and that was a very scary thought. And uh, we got a three-minute commercial break, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to Capital Forum. I'm going to uh, dismiss with the bumper music as soon as possible. We have a lot of uh, area to cover, and we are joined this morning, uh, thankfully joined with Arne Gunnarsson, and his, his website is fairwinds.org, and fair is spelled F-A-I-R-E, winds.org. And uh, during a break, we uh, we were mentioning that you, you wrote a book about what the situation is in Japan, 
and it's written in Japanese. So uh, we do have listeners in Japan, so if you could elaborate that on, on the air, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, the book is called um, Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth and the Future. And uh, the truth refers to uh, what, what Tokyo Electric and the Japanese are not telling their people about the accident. And the second half is uh, called The Future, which talks about the fact that there are alternatives available to the Japanese. Uh, they don't have to go back to nuclear power. They're going to have a rough couple of years. There's no, there's no doubt about it because, uh, you know, they put all their eggs in one basket here. But um, over the future, uh, they really have alternatives to, uh, uh, to uh, maintaining the nuclear fleet that they've got. You know, it's interesting, Arnie, your background is entirely in, in nuclear industry, and you would think you'd be defending the industry and, and welcoming new plants, but uh, it seems like you're actually saying, hey, we have a situation here, let's be honest, and let's move on to some uh, some new technology. You know, my, I, I've changed over the years. You know, I started out with a, with a master's in nuclear, and I was all bright-eyed and figuring I was going to save the world by building nuclear plants. And uh, in 1990, I was a senior vice president, and... Uh, um, I found some violations at the company, and I worked for them. They fired me. And a famous nuclear attorney said to me, Arnie, in this business, you're either for us or against us, and you just crossed the line. Wow. But even then, I believed in nuclear power. I didn't think it was well regulated, but I believed in nuclear power. And even uh, two or three months before Fukushima, I was I was saying in, in testimony that uh, we never should build another coal plant because of the global warming issues. And we should focus on renewables and conservation and things like that, smart grids. But if we can't do it, we should build nuclear power plants. Well, Fukushima changed that for me. Um, I'm at a point now where I, I know that Mother Nature can be worse than we can ever imagine, and possibly terrorists can be worse than we can ever imagine. So we've got a technology here that can destroy a nation. Uh, Gorbachev said that... Uh, it was um, Chernobyl, not um, not um, perestroika, that destroyed the Soviet Union. Really, and, and we're watching you know Japan being driven to its knees as a result of this. And I don't think we need a a, a third act in this play. I really think it's it's time to move on. Well, obviously, uh, no no pun intended, but this is just a ticking time bomb, not only in Fukushima, but in the United States and throughout the world. You know, they're building all these plants on fault lines and along the coast, and it's just set up, it's just a disaster just waiting to happen. Um, yeah, I would agree with you. You know, and the flip, the other piece of it is that uh, they're not economical. I mean, Wall Street is refusing to fund these things. We're paying for it out of loan guarantees um, coming out of Congress. And it's not a Democrat or Republican thing. You know, the nuclear lobby is so extensive, it's uh, basically permeated both parties. So both parties are, are, are shelling up uh, something on the order of $37 billion in loan guarantees for, um, uh, for nuclear plants. Um, why, if, you know, we, when you have a kid and the, and the kid is 20 years old and they need a place to stay, you say, sure, come on back to the house. And, when they're 30 and it's hard times, you might say, sure, come back to the house. But we've been subsidizing nuclear for 70 years. I mean, it, it's time to kick them out and let them make it on their own or not. And um, Congress doesn't seem to get that message. Well, and, and this gets back to the point that I brought up right before the break is, is initially there were reports that, that came out that initially TEPCO just said they were literally going to walk away from this entire situation. And, and just leave it as is. And then now there's reports that they don't want to enclose it because it's not good for their uh, their dividend, their shareholders, and, you know, it's financially not feasible. So it just speaks towards, you know, we've created this mess, and now what do we do about it because these corporations don't want to have any part of the uh, blame. Yeah, on the Japanese issue, um, there's, a, there's an argument going on between Khan, who was the president of Japan, at the, the prime minister of Japan at the time, and TEPCO, uh, the prime minister says, you did tell me you were going to walk away, and TEPCO said, no, we didn't. Um, but we owe, um, we could have had um, between 10 and 15 meltdowns in, instead of the three we had. And, and the world really owes a debt of gratitude to about 2,000 Japanese men 
and they are men because that's who they hire in their nuclear plants. But about a thousand people at Daiichi and another thousand at, at Daini, which is another plant about six miles away, stayed and risked their lives to bring those plants under control. If they had abandoned those plants, we would have had 10 and perhaps as many as 14 meltdowns. Uh, so, um, it, it wasn't a robust plant. It was a couple of hundred brave people who stayed behind that, that certainly saved Japan and likely saved the world. Interesting. And we have another three-minute commercial break, and then after that we'll have a long 20-minute segment with Arnie. But uh, one of the questions I want to pose is what are the risks to us in the United States at this point and in the future due to Fukushima? Back in three minutes. Welcome back to Capital Forum. And once again, we're joined with Arnie Gunnarsson from fairwinds.org, and fair is spelled F-A-I-R-E, winds.org. And Arnie, before the uh, break, I asked you if uh, you could elaborate on what the impact to us in the United States is currently, you know, what, what has happened since March 11, 2011, and what we have to look forward to in the future at, at the current situation if nothing else happens in Fukushima. Well, the, uh, a lot of people went out and bought pretty good radiation detectors after the accident. And um, there's an awful lot of YouTube posted um, with, uh, with people in a thunderstorm um, measuring radiation on the hood of their car or on the glass of their windshield and showing it to be extraordinarily high. Um, not all of those really applied to Fukushima. So there was a... A, a scare that ran around because a lot of radon gets washed out in thunderstorms. And we asked people who sent us those to um, to wait about five days yeah, so the radon would go away. That doesn't mean that all of them weren't Fukushima, but a lot of those um, uh, those scares with astronomically high pieces of cloth after a thunderstorm were, in fact, a naturally occurring phenomenon. But the U.S. did get hit. Um, um, especially on the West Coast. But then you'll see hot spots throughout the country as well where it happened to rain as the radioactive contamination was, was coming over. There was one in Arkansas that sticks in my mind right now. Um, but the, the worst place in the United States is the, is the Cascades. Uh, compared to Japan, it's, it's, it's maybe 10,000 times better in the United States than in Japan. But... If, um, you know, the biggest concern for the United States has got to be Seattle and Portland and up to Vancouver and, uh, and Northern California. What happened is the gases moved across the Pacific and then they hit the, the mountains and they, and they rained out. Um, especially in March, April and May of last year. So we're not talking about airborne radiation now. It's in the soil. Um, but for the three months, March, April, and May of last year, there certainly were um, hot particles in the air uh, getting into people's lungs on the um, on the West Coast. So um, what this means, uh, especially for the West Coast, is that you need to be careful about what's on your feet. Eighty percent of the dirt that gets into your house comes in on your shoes. So um, dusting... Uh, dry dusting doesn't help. Dry, dry dusting makes it worse because you throw up the dust again. Wet dusting is um, is really recommended. Um, that's probably the single, if you can knock out 80% of the problem by doing just one thing, being really careful in the, on, on house cleanliness, especially on the West Coast, um, to me that would be a, a no-brainer for for anybody in the, in the Cascades or anybody in these areas where, uh, where there was, um, uh, you know, hot particles that fell out as a result of a thunderstorm. Um, other than that, we can't run and we can't hide. It's uh, it's everywhere, and um, it, you know, it's uh, low concentrations in our food. And, uh, um, and the, the tuna issue is a different problem entirely. That, that just recently they uh, um, they announced that tuna were radioactive in the Pacific, but. There's a lot more behind that story. Uh, those tuna were caught in August of last year. They were, um, and the scientists waited to, to, to get a paper published before they announced the data. The, um, the, uh, it turns out that tuna spawn near Japan and then swim over toward the United States and grow as they, as they, as they come across. So they were, uh, eating fish near Fukushima and, um, then swam across the Pacific and, and got fatter on the 
away eating other fish. And uh, when they caught uh, 15 tuna, all 15 tuna tested positive for cesium-134 and cesium-137. Those that that means it had to come from Fukushima. There was no other. There was no other cause of it. Um, you know that they went 15 for 15 tells me that it's it's a pretty a, a pretty good bet that the uh, the bluefin tuna in the Pacific are all contaminated. And I think the contamination is going to increase with time before it goes back down. You know, uh, hopefully there are scientists that are collecting that tuna now and uh, or, and have been since August of last year when these guys first did their, their work. So we should be getting more reports of, um, uh, of, of radioactivity in these fish that are at the top of the, the food chain. Unfortunately, the government's not doing a lot of this testing. You know, it's independent scientists who certainly aren't getting a lot of money from the nuclear industry to announce this stuff either. Imagine that. <laughs> well, g- getting back to that, we heard reports from uh, uh, from Hawaii that uh, it's showing up in the milk from the cattle. Is that correct, or is that uh, from background radiation? It, it did show up in milk in the cow. The predominant isotope that shows up in cow's milk is iodine. And iodine has an eight-day half-life, so after about 90 days, it's all gone. We were picking up um, uh, radioactive iodine cows in, here in Vermont for the first um, first couple of months after the accident, but it, it's all gone now. There's still some uh, cesium in, in the cow's milk, and so I, I don't want to belittle it, but there's no place where we can run. There's no place we can hide. It's in all the milk. Um the iodine issue was different, and um, but that's behind us now because of the short half-life. Well, now that has a short half-life, but the other side of the equation is is if you have a beef operation where those babies are nursing on their mother, are they storing that radiation? And then when you digest, when you actually eat those those uh, that uh, beef, will you have that in that beef? Yeah, it goes to your thyroid, and uh, so. Um, you know, they're already seeing, in Japan, for instance, they're already seeing uh, young children with thyroid nodules. Um, that's like a precancerous condition. After, after Chernobyl, they had an enormous increase in, uh, in thyroid cancers. So the iodine preferentially goes to your, um, your thyroid. You know those pills, those radiation pills that people were running out and buying um, last year, that contains a non-radioactive potassium iodine, iodide, and it goes to your thyroid. So if it's there, then there's no way that the radiation can get to your thyroid. It doesn't really protect you from all the radiation, but it does prevent you from getting the iodine in, um, from milk into your thyroid. So that's really all that pill does. The, um, and I, you know, I, I was asked last year, I bought the pills, but here in Vermont, I didn't use them. I told my friends on the West Coast, uh, you know, in the Cascades, you should use them. But on the East Coast, um, concentrations were so low, and the pill does have a side effect. So I just didn't want to um, uh, to take that risk, and I didn't want my friends to take that risk either. And what you're referring to is the high dosage, and that's for like a, a, a near accident if you're really close to a situation. But it- in my case, I've chosen to take iodine as a daily supplement at a very low level to help saturate and just support the thyroid. Is that not a good idea? Oh, I take I take iodine as a daily supplement also. Excellent. That's right, and and I agree with you. I think you know, it it belongs in your in, in your food, and unfortunately, we don't get enough. So, I, on a supplement level, I've been taking it for years, and and um, um, it wasn't about radiation. It was that uh, you know my my naturopaths and homeopaths have been telling me that your body doesn't get enough iodine unless you supplement. And also that actually keeps out the fluoride and uh, the, the, the halide family of uh, chemicals and, and minerals and, and various things that get into our thyroid. It helps protect that. That's just what your thyroid, your thyroid needs something and there's a vacuum that's going to accept all these other things that are not healthy for it. So it's a good idea to take low levels of good iodine on a daily basis, in my opinion, and I think you reflect that as well. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, that's, that covers iodine. Now, what about some of the other cesium and some of the other things? I've read like boron, and you can get some of that from borax. Actually, it's a very cheap product. You can take boron to help neutralize. Calcium bentonite clay helps neutralize. Uh, can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, you know, the boron, um, I don't understand. Boron absorbs neutrons. 
and I, I, I don't know chemically how it affects any of the other, um, um, you know, cesiums or the strontiums, and, and so I don't understand the boron. But there have been some, uh, you know, chelate, chelating uh, compounds, and there has been like uh, zeolite. I've had people say, well, maybe I should take zeolite to, uh, to strip out the cesium. Um, zeolite is really good at stripping out cesium. The problem is it also strips out other stuff. Um, so if, um, you know, if you know you've been exposed to, you know, for instance, again, in the, in the Cascades, if you know you've been exposed to, uh, to cesium, the zeolite may make sense. But keep in mind that you're also stripping out other things that your body needs. On the bigger picture, by the way, getting back to the top of the hour, I recommend it to Tokyo Electric that they surround their plant with um, uh, an underground wall of zeolite to prevent the radioactive material from getting into the groundwater and getting into the ocean. And I was told we don't have the money. And, well, well, zeolite is fairly affordable. It's a volcanic rock, is it not? It's, it's not something that's an elaborate technology. No, you're absolutely right. It's a volcanic rock, and they they did not want to dig a trench that was about 60 feet deep and about 6 feet wide. And so, <laughs> uh, uh, once again, I guess that was a, that. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of took you off, off message there because you were talking about the supplement in zeolite. And, um, you know, I've had people send us messages um, on the site saying they are taking zeolite and they've noticed health improvements. But I've also had some physicians write in saying, you know, watch out because, yes, it does remove the radioactivity, but it removes other stuff as well. And the same for sodium alginate. And sodium alginate, I think, is a byproduct of kelp or some uh, sea uh, vegetable. But uh, I, I took that to detox mercury from my system, but that's also a good chelator. But as you indicated... It also chelates beneficial minerals, so one has to cycle that. Or the other option is if you choose not to use it now, please purchase it. And and why I recommend that is if the situation changes in Japan and or we have incidents in the United States, and it's probably just a matter of time when we do, then you'll have this stuff on hand because right now you can buy all this stuff very affordably. But as you indicated, when, when the Fukushima event happened shortly after that, potassium iodine and potassium iodate, went from like $20 for a, a uh, maybe a month supply up to like $600, $700 for that same supply overnight. So this is something you want to have in your pantry. You want to have it stored away to protect you and your family in the event we do have a situation that uh, becomes critical. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, I have a, a friend who has, uh, she, she cleaned her, uh, she removed all the lead paint from her house, not realizing it was lead paint. She has a high body burden of lead, and they're in the process of using uh, chelating agents on her. Uh, but, uh, you know, a doctor is watching her blood levels. Um, so, you know, when you start to use these um, for a, a chronic condition or you in, expect a chronic condition, uh, you know, just please be aware it's stripping out other stuff as well as the bad stuff. So now... Uh- uh, getting back to what would happen if things changed over there, what would happen if another tsunami, another earthquake, is that something that would concern, it's obviously a very much concerned to Japan, but what about the United States and the rest of the northern hemisphere? Well, what would be the worst case scenario with, with the current situation? Well, worst case is Unit 4 getting knocked over in a um, in an earthquake. Um, uh, the, um, the plant is... Um, is, is certainly damaged. I mean, you can look at it in the, in the pictures and say, wow, this isn't the plant we built. So, you know, a Richter 7 or a Richter 7-5 could crack the pool, run it dry, and cause all of that radiation to be released to the air through a fire. Um, that would certainly cut Japan in half and um, and, and likely contaminate the, the entire northern hemisphere. Um, the... Um, I, I hate to postulate beyond that until we, you know, this is, science hasn't gone here. No one has done the test to say, what if we lit off an entire nuclear fuel pool? What would happen? So we're at, at, at a spot where there there is no science. We know it's going to be bad in the United States and very bad in Japan, but just how bad, um, it, it's hard to tell. The isotopes are going to be cesium and strontium and, uh, plutonium and, and some really uh, you know, dangerous isotopes. And um, you know, I, I guess the, the message here is that I, I hope everybody just contacts um, the, the Japanese government through our Congress and says, you know, move, get this thing done. 
You don't have to. It, it shouldn't take four years to solve this problem. The um, senator in Oregon, um, sorry, I've forgotten his name, uh, is, is active in pushing this. So there is some government attention in the United States the, um, that, that is encouraging the Japanese to move just as fast as they can to get that fuel out of Unit 4. Well, and it's not only Japan. You know, this is, as you indicated, a worldwide event. So we should be using our technology in the United States instead of waging wars throughout the world. We need to be waging war against the, the, the radiation contamination of the world. You know, we spoke about it a little bit on, on during a break. Is My background is actually developing weapons to, to uh, destroy and, and wage wars. And literally, we're spending trillions of dollars for that technology. And yet, as you indicated, we for literally millions of dollars, we could be making our world much safer here in the United States and over there, and we can be using technology, like you said, zeolites and boron and other things, to to help mitigate what's going on currently in Japan. And we're just sitting on our, you know, whatever, and and we're not doing anything. Yeah, well, you know what's upset me most is that the nations of the world haven't stepped up and offered to help them. Japan is, you know, second or third largest uh, economy in the world, so you sort of expect they can do it themselves. But um, we're talking about pushing a trillion dollars here in costs. Um, whatever they saved on their oil bills for the first 40 years of nuclear power, they now they will spend cleaning up after after this uh, uh, after this disaster. So, you know, the concept that nuclear is um, is cheap. Uh, it's cheap as long as there isn't an accident, but it's a technology that can, you can have 40 great years in one bad hour, and, uh, and it just wipes it out. So, you know, my, we were talking a break about how the, the money we're spending on uh, nuclear subsidies, but on, on fighting a war that's basically over oil. If that money had gone into alternatives, um, had gone into smart grids and solar and wind, um, we wouldn't have the need for the oil that's, in fact, fueling the wars that we're presently in. And to speak towards that, I think Boeing, you know, one of the large defense corporations, developed uh, solar panels on the space station that are, like, twice as efficient as what we have here on Earth. And, and there's technology out there just, just well beyond solar. There's so much technology. And, and even in the nuclear industry, is, is, thorium, is it thorium? Is that a, a, a economical or more safe approach to a nuclear energy? If, uh, you know, it's, it's 20 years out, so uh, uh, you know, thorium. we could have had thorium reactors back in the 50s. A decision was made to go with uranium reactors, and there was a scientific battle. But basically, the reason we have uranium reactors is because we have an atom bomb. If, if we didn't have a bomb program, we would have been in thorium reactors, which are somewhat safer. I mean, they're not great, but they're somewhat safer than in your state. The, the byproduct of uranium is they can use it in uh, military weapons, so that's that's a big plus for going down that path. Uh, back in three minutes. We'll come back to Capital Forum. Once again, we're going to cut the music short because we're, we, we have obviously critical information we need to address here in a short time. So, Arnie, uh, whatever you wanted to address in the final five minutes, go ahead. Well, in, in the last week, there's been a lot of excitement in Washington. The, uh, the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the, the chairman, has been forced to, uh, to step down. The, um, uh, the four other commissioners are very pro-nuclear, and the chairman is not an anti-nuclear lunatic. He's just a regulator trying to do his job, but um, he's been forced to step down, and a new chairman is, is being appointed. Um, now that's a real coup, and it really shows how the uh, the industry controls Congress. Um, but on, on the opposite side, there, there was a thing called the, uh, the the waste confidence rule that the NRC said, "Don't worry, we can store nuclear waste on your site for a hundred or more years, and, and there's no concern." And uh, an appellate court turned that over unanimously um, that that the rule was. Uh, essentially a, a figment of their imagination that has thrown it back in their lap. So the issue of storing nuclear waste on site is now up in the air again. You know, I think it's interesting that, that nuclear proponents will say, we need nuclear and don't worry, we can figure out a way, or we already have figured out a way of storing nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years. But those same people will say, you can't do solar because we haven't figured a way of storing the electricity overnight. 
Well, if we can store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, we can certainly figure out a way of storing solar power so we can use that electricity all night long. Yeah, and certainly with the new lithium batteries, I think the technology, as you indicated, there's so much technology out there that could be funded, and, and just using lithium batteries alone takes a leap, you know, leaps forward in that storage technology. Yeah, and the more we do, the more the cost comes down. And uh, that's the exciting part. I mean, gosh, solar power has has plummeted. It's, it's about half as cheap per uh, per solar panel as it was just two or three years ago. So um, we've actually had crossed the threshold. Um, it happened a couple of years ago, where uh, nuclear is now more expensive than solar, uh, and uh, and yet we haven't gotten that message. And we 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 really need to uh, to be going to you know, solar and wind and and smart grids. So. You know, a way of pushing this power from north to south, east to west. The central station power was needed at the uh, in the last century, in the 20th century. We didn't have computers to shuffle the load, but now with 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 computers and smart grids, we don't need central station power. And it's almost like the Maginot Line in France after World War World War One. The Maginot Line was meant to fought, fight another war like World War One. Big, a big, massive wall. And here we are building massive nuclear power plants when, in fact, distributed power, small generators in, in your community and even in your neighborhood are, are likely the way of the future. Yeah, and you're exactly right. And that's, that you're hitting on a key topic for just about any issue in, in our world is, is everything's becoming centralized and that becomes fraught with, uh, tyranny and that becomes fraught with, uh, abuses of all kinds, whether it's financial or just, uh, stupidity or whatever, we need to decentralize, and as you indicated, local community-based power plants. We have so much natural gas up in Alaska that we could be using that. We could actually be using natural gas in our nuclear facilities, convert them to natural gas. There's a product called a bloom box, and it's no bigger than a pickup truck, and it generates about a megawatt of heat. It's a, it's a fuel cell. So it generates water and, uh, and electricity. That's it. And you can put them, you know, at the size of a pickup truck. I mean, my God, you can put them in your neighborhood, and it would it would fuel um, you know a couple thousand houses. And you don't have the huge transmission losses associated with it. So yeah, the technology is there to change the way we we buy energy, to change the way people control energy. And yeah, we have an opportunity to move away from these massive companies and these massive power plants. Annie Garnison, thanks for joining us, and Maggie.